Amen. Hallelujah. Healing school. Amen. Glory to God. They came to hear and be healed. Let's start. Let's turn to the book of Hebrews and we'll begin here. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Thank you for divine utterance. Lord, words that not only get to the head, but words that get straight to the heart. Hallelujah. We thank you for information that the mind craves, but we thank you even much more for revelation that the spirit, our spirit, hunger for. Hallelujah. And we thank you for transformation that the spirit of God is able to bring about in our lives. Amen? Amen. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such as you have. For he had said, what did he say? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He has said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Which, if we were to put that a different way, he has said that I have covenant with you and you have covenant with me in the blood of my son. And because of the covenant that, I, uh, that I've made with you, whereby I swore by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, because of that covenant and the reality of that covenant, and to, you see, for him to say, I'll never leave thee or I'll never forsake thee, that's a covenant phrase that includes other things. It's God saying, I have covenant with you. I have sworn I have said it. I will perform it. You can trust me. You can take it to the bank. It is impossible for me to lie. If I said it, I'll make it good. Now, because of that, the next verse is what I like. Verse 6. Because of covenant, because he said, I'll never leave thee, I'll never forsake thee, so that we might boldly say. Amen? Our saying needs to be bold, but our saying is bold, and we say what we say because of that covenant with him. You get that? We may boldly say, the Lord, is my, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what men shall do unto me. We will boldly say, the same spirit that raised up Christ in the dead dwells within me, and quick is my mortal body. We can boldly say that this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. We can boldly say that I'm going to come out of this victorious because he has said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. But this boldness in our saying comes from, what, comes from the fact that we have a covenant. Amen? And then it goes on to say in verse 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever. Now it's very interesting. Jesus... His birth was miraculous. The miraculous conception. His birth was miraculous. His, his life was miraculous. The things he did in his life were miraculous. The Holy Ghost coming upon him was miraculous. His death was miraculous. <laughs> his resurrection was miraculous. His ascension, you know what it is, can you imagine? You, you know, you're talking, you, 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 here I am, you're talking to me and I just float up into the skies and disappear. <laughs> his ascension was miraculous. And quite frankly, his return is also going to be miraculous. What am I saying? Jesus' whole life is a miracle. Well, this same miracle, Jesus, is the same today as he was then. Amen. So it should not be a surprise for us to believe and expect miracles. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he did it before, he's not a respected person, he'll do it again. And when we understand the dispensation that we're in, it's a dispensation of grace, how much more? How much more? If the old ministration of condemnation and of law, if that ministration had glory, how much more should this ministration of life, this ministration and this dispensation of the Holy Ghost, how much more should this dispensation be even more glorious? 
even more miraculous. Hallelujah. So the next verse says, verse 9, and again, this is the verse I want you to see. Not, be not carried away or carried about with divers and strange doctrines. Don't believe the strange lying doctrines that healing has passed away. That there is no more tongues. That God doesn't do this and he doesn't do that anymore. Don't believe those lying doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart, your heart and my heart, for it to be established with grace. Amen? For our hearts to be established with grace and for our hearts to be established in grace. Our hearts need to be established in grace. Our hearts need to be established in the covenant. Our heart needs to be established in truth. That way we are not going to be shaken. That way we can, because of where our hearts is established, we can boldly say. Can you see that? So I just wanted to say that as an introduction. But also the next verse here comes to my heart in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. And, and, and again, we want to continue from last week, confession unto manifestation. We want manifestation. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20 says, Now the God of peace, that's the God of wholeness, the God of nothing broken, nothing missing, the God of soundness, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now, on one aspect, it, it, it can certainly mean that the God of peace that brought again from the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of our sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Jesus, is being, Jesus being resurrected and being raised up from the dead was by and through and because of the blood of the everlasting covenant. Can you see that? Who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So there is power in the blood. Amen? There is power in the blood. Because, and because there is power in the blood, there is power in the covenant. It's an everlasting covenant because it's a covenant between God the Father and God the Son. And you and I just enter into it by faith. And God the Father will not break the covenant and Jesus cannot break the covenant. So you have a covenant that is unshakable between two parties that are perfect, that have absolute integrity. And you and I just get into it because if you be Christ's seed, then you're Abraham's seed and you're heir according to the promise. Galatians 3.29. Are you with me? So it's an unshakable covenant in the blood of Christ. And that's something we need to, to be so aware of. It's a solid covenant. It's not like the covenant between God and Abraham or God and, 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 and Noah or God and, some, and a man where the man had a weak point. Or even between God and Abraham. I mean between God and Adam. You know who was the weak link in that one? Amen? But this is a covenant between God and God. <laughs> it's unbreakable. Amen? It's unbreakable. And that's the covenant that you and I have entered into. It's an everlasting covenant. So Jesus was brought again from, from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. And I say that to emphasize the power and the authority of the blood. Because, you see, we are talking about confession unto manifestation. But we must understand when we are confessing the word of God, when we are saying what God says, our confession has for a foundation the word of God, but our confession also has for a foundation the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the Old Testament, when, when, when Moses made the covenant, the Moses, and he read the words of the covenant, he, he also sprinkled the book and he sprinkled the people concerning the words of the covenant. And I think him sprinkling the book and sprinkling the people who are saying the blood is on you and the blood is on the word. And I think that was a type of the new covenant as well, where the blood is on all the promises of God. And when you and I have accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord, that blood is on us. Amen? So the, in other words then, there's a, there's a foundation for our confession. There's a foundation for the word of God, which is the, which is the undeniable, unshakable perfect, pure, covenant blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, but now here's another aspect of this verse. 
that now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work. Amen? I didn't change the word. Did I change the words? No. What did I do? I just shifted my emphasis and I moved the commas and, the, and, and so on around. And how many of you know that when this Bible was written, it was not written with commas and full stop? Amen? You see, God is awesome. God doesn't have the limitations like you and I. You see, if, you, if I try to talk to you, every now and then I got to pause and take a breath. Every now and then I need a full stop or a comma. Amen? Or else I'm just going to run out of air. God is not like that. He doesn't run out of air. <laughs> Amen? God could, God could speak from Genesis to Revelations and never pause. And never have to take a breath. See, he doesn't need commas and full stop. <laughs> Glory to God. Ain't that good? <laughs> So then it's okay for me to read it this way. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So through the blood, God is able to make us perfect and mature in every good work in accordance to his will, and he's able to work in us by his spirit to do those things that please him. Amen? All right, I put that as there, oh, there's a foundation. Now let's go to Romans chapter 10. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> now there, there are a few copies of last week's tape and if we need more we can make some more about confession unto manifestation I thought it was pretty good and there was a there was a good anointing there on it I'm not going to try to duplicate that nor am I going to try to cover that same material but nevertheless I will say a few things Romans chapter 10 that are on that tape Romans chapter 10 reading from verse 6 it says but the righteousness which is of faith speaks or the right conduct of faith, the right way that faith operates, speaks on this wise. Say not in your heart who shall ascend into heaven to bring Christ down, or who shall descend into the deep to bring up Christ again from the dead. Don't say that. Don't say let's try to get Christ on the scene. The way faith behaves that is correct and accurate, the righteousness of faith, the right behavior of faith, doesn't say, come on, let's get Jesus down here or get Jesus up. It doesn't say that. The right conduct of faith says what? What does it say? The word is near thee, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. In other words, the right conduct of faith says, you do the speaking. You do the believing. The covenant has already been made. The redemption has already been accomplished. Jesus has already paid the price. Your healing is already a, a fact. He says, now you believe it and you confess it. You believe it in your heart and you say it with your mouth. So the word of faith, the, what does it say? The word is near you even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shall believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now let's take for a moment and take this scripture and transform it into the context of healing. Because this is a scripture that we use primarily to, for salvation. If you believe in your heart, that, that, if you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and you confess him as Lord, you'll be saved. And of course that is true. But let's, let's, let's read salvation, let's read healing into this verse of scripture. The same word translated heal is the same word translated saved. Amen? All right. So it says, that if you confess with your mouth, God, is that what it says? It is that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God, that's not what it says. If you confess the Lord Jesus, if you confess that Jesus is Lord. Think about that for a moment. Can you imagine watching some sickness that's trying to afflict your body? And you watch that sickness and say, sickness, Jesus is Lord. What would you be saying to that sickness? You're saying, you're saying sickness, 
Jesus is Lord, Master, Conqueror, King, and he is over you. You see, the Bible says that God gave Jesus a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that what? Jesus Christ is Lord. So you are saying to the sickness and the disease that Jesus is Lord. It's as if you say sickness, disease, I'm talking to you. I command you. You confess Jesus is Lord. Do you hear me? I'm saying sickness, Jesus is Lord. Repeat after me, sickness. Jesus is Lord. Sickness, you repeat after me. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Master. Can you see that? <laughs> so if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... Now, even right there, you will see that your healing is involved where you must see that Jesus is Lord over that sickness and over that disease. Can you see that? And you need to believe in your heart that Jesus was raised up from the dead, which means what? He is Lord. He is Master. He is Lord over this situation. He's been raised up from the dead, emphasizing his Lord, and I believe it with my heart, and I say it with my mouth. And the Bible says if you do that, you'll be healed. That's what the scripture say. You will be healed. Why is it work that way? Because of verse 10. With the heart, you will believe unto that which is right. You, with your heart, you will believe to that which you have a legal right to as a result of faith. You see, your faith is counted for righteousness, it says in Romans. Amen? So with your heart, you believe unto righteousness. With your heart, when you operate in faith like that, you have a right, a legal right to certain things, to what you're believing for. And with your mouth, confession will, you confess is made unto salvation, unto wholeness, unto the deliverance, unto health, Onto the manifestation. So that's where it comes from that if you confess, that confession onto possession or confession onto manifestation. Amen? But what is it based on? It's based on believing that Jesus is Lord and Master over that sickness. And confessing that he is Lord and master over that sickness. How do you know that? God raised him from the dead. <laughs> God raised him from the dead. And he had every sickness, every disease in his body. But he was raised up whole and well. Hallelujah. There's a version that says the chastisement, the price and penalty for us to have peace. That which was needful for you to have peace and wholeness was upon him. And instead of by his stripes you were healed, it says, and by the blows, by the blows that he took, you were healed. Can you see that? So it says when you believe like that, and when you confess like that, you will be healed. Because... With your heart, with, because with the heart you believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, further, further on, as we talk about confession, we also want to talk about confession in the context of not only confessing, but holding fast to your confessing, which means confessing and continuing to say the same thing. Amen? Which is like, which is confessing. Con he that, you see the Bible says, he that believeth. What does he that believeth mean? It means he that believes and continues to believe. So he that confesseth would mean he that confesses and continues to confess. That Jesus is Lord. All right. Now, why does confession work? And we talked about some of the things, but I want to repeat this particular point. Confession works because of this principle. I, I, call, it, I call it assimilation. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 6. Assimilation. Assimilate. It might be a good idea to look that up in the Webster Dictionary. Assimilate. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 21 says, all right, let's read verse 22. My son, keep 
the Father's commandment. That means keep the word, keep the word of God. Amen? Keep it. Don't let it be stolen from you. Which reminds me, you must not, as you hold fast to your confession, you must not let the devil steal the word from you. You must not let the devil push you off of your confession. You must not let the devil cause you to quit and give up. Because one of the things he does is that he would try to mentally assault the believer so as to weary him out and cause him to faint so that he will quit. And the Bible says, you only weep if you faint not. So the devil's strategy and scheme is to mentally assault the saints so as to weary them. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. That is why the Bible says, do not be weary in well-doing. In Galatians. That's why the Bible also says in Romans chapter 12, to consider Jesus. Consider him that endured such contradictions and such strife and such, and, such op and such opposition to himself. Consider him and he remained firm. Lest you become weary in your mind. Amen? So you must not allow the enemy to mentally assault you to weary you out and get you to quit. In other words, quitting is not part of it. You follow me? All right. Now, so here is my point. My point is, um, so when it says, my son, keep the Father's commandment, you get a hold of the word and you do not let it go. Have you ever seen a bulldog with a bone? Try to take that bone away. Amen? It, it doesn't let go. You can, you can take that bone and try to yank that bone away from the dog and you can literally lift that dog up off of his feet and he would not let go of the bone. Isn't that true? Well, that's what it's talking about. My son, keep the word. And forsake not the law of your mother. So keep the word of your father. And don't forsake the law of your mother. Which means keep the word. And don't forsake the word. Is that right? And then it says bind them. Bind the word continually. How long? Continually. Upon your heart. And tie them upon your neck. Now how are you going to bind the word continually in your heart? Well according to Proverbs chapter 4. The way you get the word into your heart to bind it in your heart is Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20 says attend to the word incline your ear to his saying don't let him depart from your eyes keep them in the midst of your heart in other words the way the word gets into the midst of your heart is by attending to it inclining your ear onto his saying and then not letting it depart from your eyes and that's how it gets into your heart according to Joshua it says don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth but meditate on it Day and night, day and night, day and night, that you might observe to do according to all that is written therein. So, so here in, in Proverbs chapter 6, it says, don't forget the word, keep the word, bind the word continually in your heart, and it got there by attending to it, by, by listening to it, by keeping it before your eyes. And then it says, tie them about your neck. In other words, wherever you go, do not forsake this word. Keep this word with you. Get this word on the inside of you. Verse 22. And when that happens, when you get this word on the inside of you, you see, it's not enough to just know the word. You need to get the word engrafted in you. When the word gets engrafted in you and it gets on the inside of you, here comes verse 22. When you go, it will lead you. When you sleep, it will keep you. And when you are awake, it will talk to you. In other words, that's the word talking to you, not you talking to the word. In other words, the word gets inside of you and it becomes so abundant, so rich, so full, that out of the abundance, so that what happens is on the inside, and all of a sudden, that word is like it has a voice. That word starts talking to you. Are you with me? That word starts instructing you. You, you, I mean, you're in a situation and you don't know what to do. The word will rise up and speak to you. But how did it get to the point where the word is on the inside of you and speaks to you? It got there because of the attention you give to it, because of you, of you attending to it, listening to it, speaking it, keeping it before your eyes, binding it around your neck, binding it in your heart. And that whole process is what I call assimilating. Now, and I believe, you know, we talk about meditating on the Word of God. And sometimes, unfortunately, we limit meditating to the Word as meaning thinking about what the Scriptures say and muttering it. And it includes that. But meditating in the Word 
according to my understanding as I study it out in Psalms 119 and elsewhere, is interacting with the word in every possible way that you can, continually squeezing the life of that word out of the word into you, interacting with that word so much that it becomes you. Where you, where you, where you mutter that word, where you sing that word, where you speak that word, where you confess that word. Where you write it and you put it on the mirror. Where you put it on your, on your armband. You just stay with that word. Stay with that word. Read that same. Uh, yes, you think about the word. Yes, you do word studies. But it's staying with the word. Staying with the word. You know, like this is something that I'm, I'm planning to do in the very near future where, where, where certain epistles are concerned. I've already made a decision. I'm going to be implementing it in the near future. And then I'll be doing it for years to come by the grace of God. Which is to spend time, read Read, read, say Philippians, read Galatians, read Ephesians, read Colossians, and read it again and 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 again. You say, why would you do that? Because when I'm doing it, it's like I'm taking those books of the Bible and putting them in here. And then after a while, they become assimilated. And then all of a sudden, because they've been in there for a while, the next thing you know, out of it comes revelation. All of a sudden, revelation will come. And it might seem as if it come out of the blues. It didn't come out of the blues. <laughs> It came out of what was packed in there. So that's what that scripture is saying. That if you will do that with the word, that word will eventually become assimilated. It's like somehow the other word is going to get on the inside of you in such a way that all of a sudden it will come out and begin to talk to you. It's going it's to keep you when you sleep. You're going to dream about it. And I believe with all of my heart that according to Proverbs chapter 4, that if you do that and you attend to the word, incline your ear to his word, confess the word, keep it before your eyes, put it in the mirror, get it assimilated, that it's just a matter of time and that word will become life and health to all your flesh. And that's what the Bible is talking about when it says, let the word be like, is the word being medicine. And confession is part of that process. That's what it was talking about in Proverbs 23, verse 7. That as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Again, we were talking before, and, and it's worthwhile repeating. Where does transformation come from? Where does change come from? How does a butterfly, how does a caterpillar become a butterfly? I'm sure if you ask a caterpillar, make yourself a butterfly, he couldn't do it. Do you think a caterpillar could figure out how he's going to become a butterfly? Do you think the caterpillar can take certain actions to become a butterfly? No. But God, by the power of the Holy Ghost, literally will work on that, on, on, on that caterpillar under the right conditions and make him into a butterfly. Well, in the same way, God will work on you under the right conditions to make you into a butterfly. What do I mean by that? God will work on you by the power of the Holy Ghost to bring forth that transformation and that change into what his word says. Can you see that? Transformation. That is what the Bible says when it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. That we all behold with unveiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. We are transformed and we are changed into the same image which we see from glory to glory, and it's done by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen? Have you ever, I don't know how many of you do gardening, but if you go and you buy a, a pack of seeds for some beautiful flower or tomato, you look at the package, on the package, there is an absolutely beautiful, colorful looking flower or, or tomato, and it just looks beautiful. Now, if you open that package and expect to find that, that inside the package, you're wrong. When you open there, all you're going to do is find some dry, squiggly-looking seeds. But you know something? That picture on the package is, how, is what that seed will become. But how does it get from that seed to that beautiful picture? Transformation. Well, I'm saying to you, the Holy Ghost can bring forth that transformation. Amen? Amen? But it comes, and the process, what, what is my part? What is my part with the seed? Plant it in the ground and water it. What is my part in this transformation? Yield to the Holy Ghost. Get a hold of the word. Pack it on the inside of me. Shove it in my eyes. Put it in my ears. Right? Put it on the mirror. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Sing it. Do whatever I got to do. Pack it up on the inside of me to the point where all of a sudden that the Holy Ghost can say, okay, now I'm going to take this material and produce the end result. That's the process of assimilating. That is why confession works. Because when you confess, that's what you're doing. Let me put it another way. 
God has so programmed the soul of man that the soul of man will be transformed into whatever it is exposed to continually and what is exposed to the most. So if you are exposed to a negative environment and unbelief and fear and, and, and anxiety and oppression and, and, and negative talk and negative speech and evil communication, if that's what you're exposed to, continue and that's your environment, then sooner or later that will become you. But at the same time, if you're exposed to that which is positive, life and joy and strength and victory and an atmosphere of heaven, after what heaven is going to show up on the inside of you. Are you with me? So what happens is that when you are confessing the word, what you are doing, when you are meditating and confessing the word, is that you are putting yourself into the atmosphere of the word continually, and as you do so, then a transformation takes place, and you are transformed and changed into that image of the word. And that is what it says in Proverbs 23, verse 7. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Amen? That is called serving the law of God with your mind. Proverbs 7, 25. Amen? Glory to God. And when you do that, what happens? You activate the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, verse 2. And that law has the power to supersede and rise above the law of sin and death and sickness and disease. The power of confession. So there is that principle of, of, of assimilating and confession is a part of that process of meditation. Amen? And again, we talk about the fact that the, the creative power in the word, which means the word has enough power in itself to bring itself to pass. But now let's, 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 let me go off and talk about this. I think we kind of skimmed over this, but let's stop, let's stop and pay this a little bit more attention. The ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The present day ministry of Christ. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 says, Brethren, wherefore holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Oh man, that's right there is, there is healing in that phrase alone. <laughs> There is healing in that phrase alone. Partakers of the heavenly calling. Do you know there's enough power in that phrase to heal you? <laughs> that you are partakers of the heavenly calling. You are partakers of Christ. You are partakers of his inheritance. Do you believe healing belongs to him? Well, you are a partaker of that. You see, sometimes the devil might try to make you feel that you're not qualified for healing because you did this wrong, and you did that wrong, and you did the other thing wrong, and you somehow are not qualified. But he's, he's trying to get you to be qualified based on your works. Amen? But it's not based on your works. Hallelujah. It's not based on your works. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet or able to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. The Amplified says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us, who has qualified you and made you fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints. The Father God, through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, has qualified you to be a partaker of the inheritance. Qualified you to be a partake of healing and health. In other words, you are qualified. You are a qualified candidate for healing. On what basis? The blood. Isn't that good? Because of the blood, I'm qualified. So when the devil tries to make me be disqualified, trying to tell me about me, hey, don't talk to me, talk to the blood. <laughs> Amen, talk to the blood. <laughs> are you with me? Here is the blood. Hallelujah. <laughs> So we are partakers, back to Hebrews 3 verse 1, we are partakers of the heavenly calling. Woo, glory to God. Matter of fact, let me take a next side trip here. <laughs> of the hell of heavenly calling. Think about this for a moment. Now I know doctors will do the very best they can, but the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 31, and God saw everything, say everything. 
everything that he made, that he made, that he made, and behold, it was what? Very good, not just good. It was very good. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now let me ask you something. Is sin good? Is sickness good? Well, everything he made was very good. That means sin and sickness, he didn't make it. Amen? It means he didn't make it. It means sin and sickness is not natural to you. It's foreign to you. Amen? It's foreign to you. And if it is not natural... Why should we expect the solution to be natural? Is the solution for sin natural? No. What is the solution for sin? Jesus. The shed blood of Christ. Well, in the same way sin is not natural, sickness is not natural. And the solution for sickness, you can't go to the doctor and have him fix your sin. <laughs> Give you an injection for your sin. <laughs> Take this, take this medication and you'll have no more sin. <laughs> no, but we expect to do that for sickness and disease, don't we? Right? <laughs> right? My point being that it is the same cure for sin as there is for sickness. And it's the blood of Christ. It's the finished work of Christ. There is a spiritual solution. Himself bore our sicknesses and carried our infirmities. Himself, he was bruised for our iniquity. The, chast the chastisement of our peace was upon him. He took our transgressions. And by his stripes, we've been healed of what? The sin, the sickness, the transgression, the iniquity, all of it. So we are partakers of the heavenly calling. So be so. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, stop for a moment and consider. Hmm, consider. Thoughtfully and attentively consider. Thoughtfully and, and, and attentively consider what? My problem? The sickness? The disease? The doctor's report? The information on the, uh, on the internet, the research, how many women have, have, have given, have conceived at 90 years old, much less become a father of many nations? Is there any record? No, it didn't say to consider any of that. It says that you are to consider thoughtfully and attentively, g g consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, of our confession, Christ Jesus. Consider the apostle. Now the word apostle means sent one. And the word high priest is the one who is authorized to administer and execute and implement and carry out and to bring into effect whatever you confess that agrees with his word. So it says consider this Jesus that is at the right hand of the father. That has been anointed that has been called and anointed by God, the Father, the Eternal One, and has been set into this office as a high priest with authority to implement and to execute and to bring to pass your words when they match his words. In other words, when your words are his words, when you take his words and make it your words, he is appointed as an apostle and a high priest to carry it out. So it says, consider him. Not consider the problem. The Bible says, in, the Bible says that Abraham, in Romans chapter 4 and verse, verse 19, that Abraham, he was being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. Does it mean he didn't know that his body was dead? And he considered not the deadness of Sarah's womb. Does it mean he didn't know Sarah's womb was dead? But he didn't consider it. He didn't meditate on it. He didn't focus on that. Amen? In other words, God is not saying that you should not, that you, should not that you are to pretend the problem doesn't, does, uh, does not exist. But he is saying 
Don't, do, don't consider that. Don't focus on that. Don't let your mind and your thinking be locked up in that. Because you see, the things that are seen are, 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 are temporal. And the things that are not seen are eternal. And, if, and, and the Bible says, while you're in the midst of this test and trial, this test and trial will be for a moment. Which means it wouldn't last as long as it potentially can, providing you consider not the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. Can you see that? In other words, Second Corinthians 4, verse 17 and 18 also tells you how to make a trial not last longer than, you want, than it should. Trials are not fun. Yes, we know trials can build character, but let me build my character and move on. <laughs> <laughs> you follow me? <laughs> right? I want the trial to be as short as possible. We've got other things to do. <laughs> and so it says, here is a way how you can make it momentary. In other words, not as long. And the way is considering not the things that are seen, but are the things that are not seen. And that's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. Amen? Our light affliction, which is, but, which is but for a moment, work it for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but on the things which are not seen. Look not, and that's talking about considering. So Abraham, not being weak in faith, he considered not his own body now there. That's what faith that is not weak operates. That's how faith that is not weak. This is how it operates. It doesn't consider the problem. That he was about 100 years old. Or the deadness of Sarah's, Sarah's womb. And because he wasn't considering that, he staggered not. And then it says he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. In other words, had he been considering his body and considering the deadness of Sarah's womb and had his mind been fixed on the circumstances, he would have staggered at the promise of God. He would have fallen into unbelief. And the promise of God might have somehow been weakened in his mind and in his thinking. Can you see that? In other words, what you consider seems to get more life and strength. If you consider the promise, the promise becomes stronger. But if you consider the problem, the problem becomes stronger. Amen? In other words, then, it seems that you're you become more sensitive or more inclined to what you fix your heart and your mind on. Well, let's get become more sensitive to God and to his word and to his truth by fixing our heart and mind and on the word and on the promises and on the blood. Let your heart be established with grace. Let your heart be established in righteousness. Let your heart be established in the covenant. Consider that. And then the Bible says, and as a result, what happened? He grew strong. In, in, instead of doing that, he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Amen? Amen. So let's get back to Hebrews chapter 3. So it says, consider. Consider the problem? No. Consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Consider him. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So Jesus, as your high priest, and your, and your, and your, and your, as your high priest, as a person high priest of your confession, what does he do? He says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, you don't need to turn to it. He says, if you confess me before men, I will what? I will confess you before the Father. If you deny me before men, then I'll deny you before the Father. What do you mean deny me before the men? Well, remember the Bible says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 13, it says their words were stout against God. In other words, God said one thing, they were saying something else. Amen? They were saying something else opposite to God, and God says, in other words, God says your words are stout against me. It is as if God says you're being rude. When you speak contrary to God's word, God considers you as being rude. Amen? Can you imagine that? We know it's uneven, but I wasn't rude. Now my words weren't. Oh, yes, it was. Remember, remember, Sarah. I didn't laugh. God says you laughed. I heard you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Glory to God. So when you confess him before men, he will confess you before the fathers in heaven. Hebrews chapter four, verse fourteen. So it says then. 
seeing then that we have this great high priest that is passed into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Because we have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Come, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. You've got a high priest that is sympathetic towards you. You've got a high priest that is standing in the gap for you, that is making a case on your behalf. That is pointing to the blood. When the devil comes with accusations, the, Jesus is saying, Father, here, the blood has been shed. They are trusting in the blood. And on the basis of that, they have a right to say certain things. They can boldly say. Amen? But what if you don't boldly say? What if you don't boldly speak? What if you don't say what the word says? Then you're speaking words that are stout against him. But the, your words that are stout against him, what happens with those words? Those words will bind the angels. Sometimes angels are involved with your deliverance. Sometimes angels are even involved with your healing. I don't know, but I, I, there, there, I, I've heard, uh, uh, matter of fact, um, is it? I, I, well, very recently we, we, we heard about sometimes, you know, sometimes somebody dies, dies what might seem like a horrible death in a car crash or something like that. And this person went to heaven and said one of the things, sometimes, not all the time, but for the, the, sometimes a split second before that accident actually takes place, but just a split second before, that person is snatched out of their body so that they might not necessarily experience all that pain and agony that is involved in that, in that brutal crash. Think about it. Amen? Angels are involved with our deliverance. Angels are involved. The Bible says the angels came and ministered to Jesus. You might be in a situation where you are so tired and you are so wiped out. And angels can come and minister to you. Amen? They came in here when you did. They are with you all the time. They don't leave you. But the Bible says in Psalms 103 and verse 20 that they hearken to the voice of his word. And they do his will. They do God's pleasure. And God's pleasure is to prosper you. God's pleasure is for his will to be fulfilled in your life. God's pleasure is for you, you to be healed, for you to be blessed, for you to be prosperous, for you to be full of joy and strength. Amen? So they're involved in, in, in carrying out God's will and desire for you. But how do they do it? They hearken to the voice of your word. So if the words that you are speaking are stout against God and they are contrary to the word of God, then the angels can't can't do anything. Their hands are tied. Amen? But in the meantime, when we speak unbelief, the devils and the demons, they are released to come into the situation. We are making room for them. So who are we going to license with our speech? God, Jesus, the angels, or the devil, and demons? Are you with me? Are we going to activate the law of the spirit of life in Christ? Or are we going to activate the law of sin and death? So it is up to us. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Amen? So choose you this day. Life or death? Choose. Are you with me? So it's very important for us to understand that. As a matter of fact, if you turn with me, turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. You know how that the Bible says in... Um, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Well, if that scripture is true in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, and Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, it means that if you don't bind it on earth, God is not authorized to bind it in heaven. And not in heaven meaning where God lives. Yeah, there's nothing up there need binding. <laughs> Amen? Everything up there is cool. <laughs> right? And good and very good. There's nothing up there that you need binding, that needs binding at all. But in the second, the heavens above here where devils and demons operate, where they try to hinder the answer to your prayers, just like they try, they try to hinder the answer to Daniel's prayers. But let me ask you something. The angel, Michael, that was on the way, was it Michael? That was on the way to come and bring an answer to Daniel, but he was hindered because of the, the, the demonic warfare and stuff that was happening in the realm of the spirit. In the, in, in the second heavens, I think it was. If 
Daniel had refused to pray, would that angel have been on the way with an answer? If Daniel had, Daniel had refused to, he said, you know what? This thing ain't working. <laughs> I mean, I'm praying and I ain't seeing nothing happening. Let's just forget it. I, let, let, I might as well go and play with Nebuchadnezzar, little kid, kids or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> Can you imagine if Daniel did that, then the battle that Michael and the angels were involved in, they may have lost that battle. In other words, Daniel's prayers authorized and authorized them to keep fighting. Daniel's prayers give them the equipment that they needed to do in heaven what he was doing on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, our prayers, our confession can affect God and can affect what's happening in heaven. If we don't bind it on earth, then it's not bound in heaven. So it says in, my, in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him. They overcame him. Him who? The devil. They overcame him by what? The blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto death. Let me put it this way. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and their testimony that agreed with that blood. And they wouldn't back off on it. They wouldn't back off from their testimony. They wouldn't back off from the blood, even if it meant their life. Therefore, rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, etc., etc. All right. Therefore, rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. But the whole thing is, this victory... If they had not, if they would back off from the blood and back off from the word, then it would affect, it would affect the, 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 the angelic powers of God that is fighting against those demonic forces. So it is, there is some truth, there is truth to the fact that whatever you ban on earth, God will back you up in heaven. But if you're not doing anything down here, then he's not able to do anything. In other words, the angels, they, have, they excel in strength. They have great power and wisdom. But they are still waiting on you. Amen? Again, it's like helpers. You lift one side, they lift the other side. You might only be lifting the little tiny, the, 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 you know, the, little, the, the side that is not too heavy. They'll take the heavy weight. They excel in strength. But you've got a part. It's like you are the little wheel that initiates the moving of the big wheel. You know, like two cogwheels? A little tiny cogwheel here, and a big, huge wheel, big wheel here, and that big wheel is what is causes the victory, but you got to turn this little wheel. <laughs> and that, this is where the little wheel is. Are you with me? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. So the Bible says life and death is in the power of your tongue. Turn with me to Luke chapter 17. So what does confession work? Because of the process of assimilation, because of the fact that there is power in the word of God, and the word is that God is able to bring itself to pass, because of the ministry of Jesus, because of the power of the Holy Ghost. We didn't talk about that, but the Holy Ghost is a performer. The Bible says he performed miracles, and he does it by the hearing of faith. Galatians 3 verse 5. The Bible says in Psalms 57 and verse 2, that the Holy Spirit, he performs all things. The Bible says in Psalms 138 verse 8, that he perfects everything concerning you. Whatever concerns you, he has a responsibility to perfect it. But you got to cooperate with him. Amen? We've been talking about that in the morning sessions regarding praying in tongues and so on and so forth. He is assigned to perfect that which concerns you. But you got to give him something to work with. So why does, why does confession work? Because it activates Jesus. It activates the Holy Spirit. It activates the, the, the angels. And I didn't mention this, but let me throw it in there quickly. Yeah, let me throw this in there. Flip over with me to, um, yeah, to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to come back to wherever we were going. And we go to Hebrews chapter 11 for a moment. Then we'll come back to Luke. So, I mean, 
Right. And look in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 11. That's easy to remember, 11, 11. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Do you know today is 20, 11, the 20th day of the 11th month in the 20th in 2011? 2011, 2011. Well, let's look at 11, 11. Hebrews. True faith. Sarah also. I like the word also. <laughs> True faith also. Sarah receives strength to come. True faith also, Sarah. In other words, Sarah is not to be left out. <laughs> Amen. In other words, I mean, I mean, Abraham have a part in, the, in, 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 this, in this hall of faith. So does Noah, and so does Enoch, and so does, does, um, does, 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 does Isaac and Jacob. But Sarah will not be left out. Hallelujah. <laughs> so it says, true faith also, Sarah. Say also, Sarah. Glory to God. You can put your name right in there. <laughs> I will not be left out. True faith also, Ian. <laughs> True faith also, Sarah herself. Not somebody for her, but Sarah herself. I like that. Glory to God. Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. And was delivered of a child when she was past age. You said, well, it was Abraham's faith. Not according to this scripture, it wasn't. It says Sarah herself <laughs> received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she, not he, not Abraham, she judged him faithful who had promised. Faith, can you imagine you are in a position where I'm going to judge God? She decided she's going to sit as judge over God. And she judged. God is faithful. And God says glory to God. <laughs> I'm going to give Sarah strength to conceive. Even though she might be in her 90s. And she's past age. A miracle took place in her body because she received strength. Because she judged God as being faithful. What is my point? Confession will move God. Because when you confess right, and you boldly say, you are judging God as being faithful. And that honors him. That honors him. And God says that when you honor him, what will happen? He'll honor you. Amen? When you humble yourself, he will exalt you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let me see if I can get one more in here. And yeah, that's one more in. Um, Luke chapter 17, and then we're going to close. Luke chapter 17. Hallelujah. Now you recall this story. The disciples had said to Jesus in Luke chapter 17 and verse 6, in verse 5, his apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might what? Say, this is the Lord, increase our faith. This is if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say, to the sycamore tree, be plucked up by the roots, and be thou planted in the sea, and it shall obey you. What was going to obey you? Is it a tree? Yeah. But the tree is going to obey you because your faith will obey you. And the faith will go and cause the tree to be removed. But which of you, and, he's, and look at this, and he says, but which of you, <clears throat> having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say to him, by and by, when he has come from the field, go, sit down to, to meet and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird yourself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, drunken, and afterward you shall eat and drink. Did he thank the servant because he did the things which were commanded him? I, I think not. So likewise you, when you shall have done all, etc. Here is the point. Now you look at this and you think, wait a minute, this is not nice. I mean, you ought to say to the servant, well, thanks, I appreciate it. Why don't you sit and get something to eat? No, but the servant came in, from taking care, of the, taking care of, the, uh, of, of the sheep and the goat, and you send him back out to go do something else. And when he come, he say, come feed me. Man, you sound like a slave driver. But you see, when this servant that he's talking about here is your faith. The topic was faith. How do I increase my faith? He says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say, you will send faith, which is your servant, to go out and do the job. 
Amen? And when your faith come back from doing that job, what do you? Send them on another job. Keep your faith busy. How do you keep your faith busy? By your confession. Confession releases faith and sends faith out to work. Are you with me? And every now and then, well, all right, you don't want your servant to get weak, so you got to feed him. So every now and then you sit your faith down and you feed him some more word so that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and you give your faith some muscle. Amen? Glory to God. Does that make sense to you? Hallelujah. So there's a reason for confession. Confession brings manifestations. 